Hello everyone. So um, I hope you're well. Um, hi, Craig. Uh, I hope you're well too. Um, my first question is, uh, is very easy. Um, how is it going for you uh, today? Well, it's, good. it's going well. I think we're, we're used to a kind of a new normal. I'm standing here in my home office where I've been for the last six months and uh, it's, it's great to be with you, at least virtually. I, I think I'd rather be in Maastricht itself, but here yeah. I am. Obviously, amazing. Okay, um, so my name is uh, Emilio Torres. Uh, I'm uh, the co-founder of um, the Maastricht uh, Entrepreneurship Club with uh, Rock and, uh, and Arnaud. And um, today we are going to have a, a presentation of, uh, of Craig. And after this uh, small presentation of uh, about uh, 20, yeah, 20 minutes, right? Um, we are going to have a, a Q&A with, uh, with Craig, uh, Rock and I. And uh, at the end of the session, we will leave some time um, for uh, open questions for the, for the public. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can put it in the, in the chat. And uh, Arnaud is going to, uh, to lead this, uh, this part. So I think that today it's really a, a very special day. Uh, we have an exceptionally good uh, guest speaker, uh, Craig Fenton. Uh, let's be honest, guys, we are very lucky to, uh, to have him. So uh, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for coming for, the, for the, the first webinar of the Maastricht uh, Entrepreneurship Club. Um, I consider Craig like uh, an example of someone uh, very dedicated in uh, entrepreneurship, in, uh, in podcasting, in YouTube, uh, and also obviously in uh, inspiring the new generation of uh, passionate entrepreneurs. Um, but maybe uh, before like, we start the interview, let me just give you the, the context. So uh, a few months ago, I have uh, contacted uh, Craig and uh, I asked him to, uh, to join uh, for uh, today's session to share his story and, uh, and share his vision as a, as a Google director. And I really believe that um, the webinar of today shows and is the perfect example um, that, uh, to show that Craig is someone willing to, uh, to give back, uh, someone to, uh, inspire, uh, to, uh, to inspire passionate entrepreneurs. And, um, and, and no matter who you are, no matter where you are from, Craig is someone willing to, uh, to give back. So uh, thank you very much for doing so. And obviously, I will do less of the stuff about me and, and the club uh, and more about uh, you, Craig. So um, again, Welcome, and um, I think that uh, now the, the floor is, uh, is yours. Well, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's certainly my privilege to be with you, or 229 of you, according to the participant count here. Uh, thanks to those who have been brave enough to use the chat as well. Please continue to do that. I'll try and keep an eye on it. Now, I'm going to try and share my screen here. Just uh, give me the thumbs up if you can can see that, Emilio. Yes. Yeah, we yes. can see it. Cool. Okay. So I'm going to give a short talk about creating a culture of creative leadership. And my thesis in, in uh, today's age is that this is um, uh, this this notion of, of creativity and creative leadership is absolutely essential. So let's go. Let's start actually by winding the clock back to this iconic picture. Uh, which uh, is etched uh, on our minds in the archives of history as a, a, a great um, innovation and breakthrough for humankind. Uh, but what I think was even more interesting than what was going on on the, uh, on the moon is what was happening back here on Earth with the men and women of NASA. You can see them lined up here with their IBM jackets. And they were flying most of the mission. There was very few parts of that moon mission that were flown by the astronauts. And they were using uh, what passed at the time as uh, supercomputers of the day. You can see the panels, they, they occupied whole rooms. Uh, and then they are busy at their green screens. Uh, yet the technology that they were using just over 50 years ago was less powerful than the technology we carry around with us uh, today in our pocket, uh, the smartphone. Uh, and that's just 50 years ago. And if you think about it, that pattern of innovation has continued. Uh, modern computing, I think the uh, Macintosh computer came out in 1984. So really modern, affordable computing in the personal sense 
is really only about a 35 year old story. The modern internet as we know it uh, today and love it today is about 20 years old. Google's just celebrated application of machine learning and uh, for about five years because you know we needed the processing power and usable digital with us. And then last year uh, we made a breakthrough with a small Google team and, and there are other big teams, uh, a topic called quantum computing. Do you spot the pattern? 5, 22, 13, 5 last year. So what's happening here is two things. First, uh, you've got an increasing compression cycle of innovation where each major breakthrough comes closer in time than the last one. 50, 35, 22, et cetera. And then the second thing that's happening is that the step change that this innovation brings about is even more material than the last. Uh, so innovation is happening faster and it's happening more materially in each step. And that has changed us. You know, we all walk around with this little device in our pocket today. Um, I think sometimes too reliant on it. I certainly find myself spending more time on the screen than I would like, and definitely that's true of my teenage sons. Uh, but it's also uh, given us great uh, opportunity and taught us different habits. We've become uh, curious. So before we make a decision, we, we research it, don't we? We look it up online or we uh, consult social channels or whatever. So we're curious, we're impatient. Amazon's taught us to expect next day delivery. There are lots of other e-commerce providers who, who provide same day delivery or curbside pickup, uh, particularly now during COVID. Uh, and we're, we're, uh, we're impatient and, and we're, we're demanding as well. Uh, so it needs to be absolutely relevant, absolutely personal and in the moment. So curious, demanding, and impatient. And for many companies, that's created amazing opportunity. You know, many of the unicorn companies we, we see today have harnessed uh, these changes and made our lives uh, better uh, as a result and, and given us greater services. But for others, uh, they've struggled. And, and, and let's pause for a moment and, and think about some of the um, I'm going to call it roadkill, you know, the, the companies that have succumbed uh, to the uh, increasing cycle of innovation. Nokia. If I was giving this talk back in 2007, I would probably be talking about Nokia as the high watermark in innovation, the best case uh, of innovation. In 2007, when Steve Jobs walked onto the stage, Nokia had more share of the global handset market than all of the other handset manufacturers put together. Uh, put together. And, and this is a company that started in forestry, it then produced rubber boots, and then it changed to telecommunications, high-tech equipment. Uh, so this was a really innovative company filled uh, with very, very smart people. And today, in their handset, manifestation, they don't really exist. There's a few IP licenses out there, you see the odd handset, they don't really exist. Um, they, they have a, a telecommunications equipment business, but that's about it. Um, so what a fall. Uh, Toys R Us, I remember uh, spending many days and losing many hours with my boys, wandering the, the aisles of Toys R Us. They were the supermarket of children's entertainment and, and 
and, and uh, plastic tat. And of course, if you can get range and convenience online, who needs a superstore? They don't exist anymore. And Blockbuster, this was the, uh, the corner shop that you went to uh, for everyday entertainment. You'd go there for your DVDs or your videos and your popcorn, and you'd come, you'd come back and, uh, and watch it. Um, here's a fun fact, by the way. Blockbuster had the opportunity to buy Netflix uh, in the uh, early noughties for $50 million, and they passed it up. And of course, the rest is history. Today, they don't exist. Uh, and these are not silly companies, and they're not silly people who are running them. So what's going on here? I would argue that these companies uh, have succumbed to millennia of hardwired human evolution. They're fighting against human evolution. And I'm going to do a risky thing here. I'm going to check that uh, in a live test. You need to be ready to type something into your comments. I'm going to show you a slide. That slide is going to have two lines on it. Each of those lines will have an arrowhead. And I want you to type, as soon as you see it, which line is longer, right, top, bottom, or whatever. You ready? Three, two, one. Quickly, quickly. Equal, same, same, same. Bottom, well, look at that. Amazing. I think we can safely say, if you're watching those comments, that the consensus or the majority say that they're the same. I fooled you. More to the point, your brains fooled you. And I made the same mistake when I first saw this. Our brains in a complex world are hardwired. Uh, to seek familiar patterns. Uh, we make sense of the world uh, by looking for things that we recognize and, and, uh, and feel are familiar. And we draw very fast conclusions as a result of that. And I would argue that this is something that all of us, those of us who are in, uh, in companies or in governments or in other organizations are fighting day in, day out with this increasing uh, pace of innovation, our brains are kind of working against us. Nokia, back in 2007, thought, I've seen this before. You know, this is just another device. It's like BlackBerry. We'll see it off. But of course, it wasn't. What they failed to detect is that the market had subtly moved. It was no longer about the handset. It was about the ecosystem that that handset existed on, the App Store, iTunes, and everything uh, that we uh, that we know and love. So humanity has evolved to make sense of a complex world by looking for patterns and developing these mental models where we seek the familiar and we act fast on what we think we see. But what that does. Is it, uh, is it fools us into missing um, very subtle but sometimes very important changes. So it's not all doom and gloom. There's another uniquely human characteristic called imagination. And this is, uh, this is a, 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 a counterpoint uh, to this other sort of familiarity trap. This ability to imagine a world that's different from today and, and then go create it. So let's look at a few examples of companies where I, who I think have, uh, have done that. Um, they've imagined a different future and they've moved a market. Apple Computer. I've given the Steve Jobs example a few times, um, right? But remember, Apple Computer in the 80s was a consumer electronics company. They became a music company and an apps company. Everything that they now do exists to serve the ecosystem uh, of services, as they call it, that they have created. Uh, so they reimagined uh, a market and they, and they moved that market as a result. Lego, 
great company. I remember, you know, I'm a, I'm a dad. I remember uh, stomping around, stepping on Lego blocks. Fun fact, uh, I think it's scientifically proven that the most painful thing that can ever happen to a human is to step on a Lego block, a physical Lego block. But look at what this company has done. They evolved and they went to robotics. They went to a virtual version of Lego. My kids used to design uh, new Lego objects and then order them to make them in the physical world. Even adult Lego, the big Millennium Falcon and other sort of uh, very sophisticated things are available. And then Netflix, let's return to that old, uh, uh, old number. Netflix, by the way, started out not as a video on demand platform, but as a mail order DVD company. And do you know why? The founder was a Blockbuster com uh, customer and he returned a DVD and got a $40 fine for returning it late. And he said to himself, surely there's a better way. So he started this new company called Netflix and they were a mail order DVD company. Uh, they obviously evolved into a video on demand entertainment uh, Goliath, uh, who last year spent $10 billion on original content. That's more than most of the large movie studios and TV production houses put together. And remember, Blockbuster had the chance uh, to, to buy them. So these are, these are good examples, I believe, of companies that have harnessed that collective human imagination capability and translated it into a valuable innovation that's moved to market. These are not just uh, examples that I have picked out to serve my, my point. This is a systemic uh, pattern that we see. Um, these are the top five companies in the, in the world by market cap. Uh, over a 10 year period between 2008 and 2018. And do you notice something? There's not a single company on the left hand side that is also on the right hand side. So we see this playing out at a macro scale. Uh, the half life of companies who are uh, succumbing uh, to this increasing compression cycle uh, is getting shorter and shorter. So my contention uh, and the big sort of point of, of my talk today is that this human quality called imagination um, is a superpower. Creativity uh, is as important in business as it is in the arts and those uh, things that we typically associate creativity with. Uh, because imagination harnessed in a creative way and then applied uh, to produce value is what companies call innovation. That's the word that we use in business for creativity. So how do you make that happen in a company or an organization? I'm going to leave you with three ideas on this. First idea is you've got to create the mindset in the company. This is a picture of the All Blacks rugby team. I'm a New Zealander originally, so of course I've got to give this example. This is our national sporting team. Uh, and uh, not only uh, are the All Blacks rugby team the most successful rugby team over the last hundred years, they are the most successful sporting team of any sport in the last hundred years. So they're a studied institution. And one of the principles the All Blacks had uh, is this. When you're on top of your game, you change your game. I'll say it again. When you're on top of your game, you change your game. So the first idea here is to introduce this mentality in a company, in an organization, in a government, where there's this relentless restlessness, uh, this notion that uh, we're in a constant state of evolution and we're always looking around the corner for what's next. Second, play. Create an environment in which experimentation and playfulness um, is common and rewarded. Um, because in a fast moving environment, and, and particularly in today's fast moving environment, we just don't know. It's easier to create the future 
than to predict it. And to create the future, you need to experiment, you need to uh, celebrate well-calculated failure, learn from it and move on and do that rapidly and always. So play, create that playful environment. At Google, we say uh, we treat serious things playfully and playful things seriously. And then the third thing uh, is to ask the audience, never before have we been more able to reach out and get feedback in real time on the ideas that we have in a company, in an, in an organization. We can get real time feedback on what works and what doesn't work. We can scale it, adjust it or kill it, depending on the answer to that. And some companies even use this ask the audience uh, ability uh, to get the ideas in the first place. And kind of, if you think about it, that makes sense. Even at Google, we've got about 140,000, I think, at the latest count, 140,000 employees globally. Uh, but that also means there's about 8 billion people that don't work for Google. So the odds are the best ideas are going to be on the outside, not on the inside. So we use this a lot in our day-to-day -day operation, this notion of putting our users, you, me, and everyone else who's uh, listening to this, uh, at the center and, uh, and getting feedback and, and acting accordingly. So three things to leave you with. Change your game when you're on top of your game. Create an environment of play. That notion of relentless uh, uh, excitement about uh, experimentation and evolution. And then third, ask the audience. Thank you very much. I think that's about 17 minutes. So I'll hand back and I think we're going to do some Q&A. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Craig. Thanks for the, this uh, already good insight on, on um, this disruptive way of thinking. And um, I think after- I think you're on mute. Oh. Okay. Sorry, can, can, you, can you hear me? Can you hear us? Yeah, I think people. Can you hear us, Craig? I can't hear you. No. Um, did not. Maybe it's just me. Yeah, I think it's it's just you. So, um, yeah. Wait, let's. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to shut down this Zoom and I'm going to rejoin immediately. Just bear with me. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So guys, maybe now it's the, the moment to, um, to, to shoot your, uh, your, yeah, your questions here. And, um, and we are going to, uh, to ask uh, uh, a few questions about yeah, the, the presentation, but uh, also uh, about his uh, Yes, his uh, experience. So, if you want to yeah. uh, to shoot uh, to shoot some questions, it's uh, I think it's the, the good moment. So, Craig, can you, uh, can you hear us? Ten four. I read you loud and clear. Sorry about that. Here I yeah, am. yeah, perfect. Yeah, no, no, no problem. It's, it, it happened. <laughs> so, no, thanks, thanks for the this presentation and these insights. Um, you talked a lot about creativity and uh, imagination. And um, uh, one question we had after listening to you would be if this uh, point of view, you had it before arriving at Google, or, or, it, or you could say that the Google kind of taught it to you. Would you say it, it's something you had before already? Or? Um, I, I think I probably had the instinct before. You know, I worked for a long period with a company called Accenture, and we used to work with um, companies in various states of digital disruption. So I'd seen it kind of on the road in a while. I guess what Google did is sort of confirm it. Mm, okay, and, and um, I think people will have many questions also on your, on your talk about more this disruptive way of thinking. Uh, maybe now let's take a step back and talk maybe more about your career and your path and your vision. Um, uh, we saw that um, in the past years, you've been uh, investing in a few startups and companies. So now we talk maybe a bit more about this part of venture capitalism that really interests many people, I think. Uh, you invested in companies in the UK, but also uh, abroad, like Nigeria, Kenya, and in various fields. 
like tech or, or and, uh, and other fields. Um, a question would be, what are the criteria you have um, before investing in a company? Uh, is it a team, um, project, or maybe something else? What's, what's your, your top, top criteria? Yeah, I've got a, I think I'm up to nine, nine companies that I've got a, I'm an angel investor, I suppose you'd say, right? I, I invest small amounts in early stage uh, companies, uh, seed stage, if, for those of you um, familiar with the sort of various realms of uh, capital raising. So typically the first uh, raise uh, a, a, a young entrepreneurial team has. And um, I get a lot of energy. Um, you know, I love great ideas. I love disruptive ideas. I, I, I love working with, uh, with people who have a vision and a passion for, uh, for something that's gonna change the world in some way. So I, I find it super invigorating. And in answer to your question, I think probably my answer is gonna be the same as most venture capitalists or angel investors. I would say 60 to 70% I invest in the team and the, and the founder or founders, uh, and 30 to 40% I invest in the idea. Uh, and the reason for that is that, um, is that notion actually of uncertainty and, and continuous change we just talked about. Uh, the plan that you have as a young business will be wrong by the time you finish writing it. Uh, so the ability of the founding team to roll with the punches, uh, to be really good students and curious listeners uh, to their audience, their uh, customer base, and to evolve and adapt is what is critical and really makes the difference between uh, a company that can build value over time and, and, and not. On the idea itself, I look at the typical things. I'll look at the uh, raise valuation, uh, the, the number that they're looking for, what the use of funds will be, uh, what the revenue and margin projections are over time. I want to see a, a path to profitability. And I have my own, own rule of thumb. Uh, about the, multi the exit multiple on a three to five year uh, horizon. Most um, investors will look for about a 15, that's one five X uh, minimum uh, return. And why? Uh, because for every 10 companies you invest in, you lose all of your money on most of them and uh, hopefully make a, um, uh, you know, more than enough to, to compensate on a couple. Okay, thank you. And I think that besides being a, a, an investor uh, yourself, you, uh, you are an entrepreneur and you started uh, some projects, uh, some entrepreneurial uh, projects from, from scratch. So um, maybe you can, first of all, um, explain to the public um, what is uh, Eggs Coffee and uh, inspiration and how did you come up with uh, this idea? Yeah, it's a mad title, a Coffee, Eggs and Inspiration. Um, I, I try to meet two or three new people every week, and I've done that for many years. And it occurred to me, I'm, I'm very fortunate, I, I get to meet some really, really interesting people. And um, they're not just the sort of people that you see in the newspapers and, and, and the team, not the sort of celebrities I'm talking about. I'm talking about ordinary people you have probably never heard of doing absolutely extraordinary things. And I thought, uh, why not film it and share it? Uh, so that's, that was the, uh, the, the idea that, that, that started the channel. Coffee, eggs and inspiration. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. I'll, I'll uh, put the link below and you know, do all of that stuff that YouTube really, is doing. Really, 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 I'm yeah. still collecting subscribers. I can get another, what is it, 246 subscribers. That'd be great. Really? Um, the, the, other, the other part of it, um, and this is a serious part, you know, I'm a, I'm a leader in a, a, in a technology company. Uh, Google includes YouTube. It's one of, our, um, uh, one of our companies. And I thought, what better way uh, of learning more about what we do than to experience one of our platforms as a creator? So I very deliberately set out to do all of it myself. Um, I do all of the, obviously it's a little bit funny at the moment because I'm using a webcam, but um, most of the content on the channel is filmed only with my smartphone, my Pixel phone, by the way, of course, uh, with a decent mic 
uh, because I wanted to prove to myself and then credibly stand in front of audiences like you and say, look, if you've got an idea and a smartphone, that's enough. You can become a creator and reach a global audience. So I do all of the filming, editing such that it is, there's not much editing, and publishing only on a smartphone in normal times. Uh, at the moment, I'm using the webcam. But we, we, will, uh, we will also uh, share the link afterwards, or you can share it if you want, uh, with the name also. Um, and um, I think now we just have also more specific questions, because as you can imagine, we had lots of questions in our pool of questions. It was hard to pick just a few. So one yeah. question that we decided to ask you, because it really interested us, and maybe the audience also, it was concerning more um, a hot topic, we could say, called, uh, which is data. Um, you know, in the past, there were the big oils, and now we can talk about the big tech companies, the, the GAFAs. And, um, and what we say is that even um, data became more valuable than oil, some people say. So our question was, um, is, um, is data the future of Google, and is it the most important asset that Google relies on, you could say? Or are there more important assets uh, for Google in the, in the future? Yeah, thanks. Great question. I, I hear that oil analogy a lot. You know, data is the new oil. Um, I disagree with that statement, and let me explain why. Um, oil is finite. Oil is finite. Um, it is uh, also limited um, by land ownership uh, in terms of accessing it. Uh, and data has neither of those characteristics. Um, data, data is infinite. It's, uh, you know, more data, digital data will be created this year than in 5,000 years of human history. And the same will be true next year. Uh, so it's expanding exponentially. Um, and um, it, it's out there for everyone uh, to, to mine. If you're a digital business, you will have data. You will uh, build a customer base and you'll have um, information, obviously, uh, following the, uh, the guidance, the national guidance around uh, GDPR and other privacy regulation, but you'll have data. Um, yes, it's super, super valuable because what it gives us is fundamentally, it, it, it gives us an ability um, to deliver a more thoughtful, relevant product, whether it's a product or a service, uh, to an end customer that matches their needs. In the old days, you know, certainly pre-computing, um, we had to guess that. Uh, now, uh, we can discern it and make more educated choices. And I think we all feel that, right, as, as customers. I certainly do. You know, if I go on and into my phone and, and search for a, um, I don't know, a shirt uh, that I want to buy. I know it's going to give me um, something that's, uh, that I can, first of all, read on the device that I'm looking at it uh, on. It'll probably tell me uh, the shops that are near me and whether those shops are open. And in many cases, whether they have my size. Um, and all of that is... Uh, you know, is made possible because um, in a thoughtful way, companies uh, are using data um, to, uh, to deliver a more relevant and valuable uh, service or, or product. Um, Google is no different. Um, the one thing that I would uh, highlight here uh, is that uh, privacy and respecting personal information is absolutely at the center of everything that we do. And this is not new today. It, it was one of the founding principles that Larry and Sergey uh, set the company up with. You know, it's about the user, you know, all of us at the end of the day. And you've got to serve them uh, first. Uh, so if you're a, a consumer of Google services, whether it's Gmail or Photos or you have an Android phone or you use Chrome or whatever it is, YouTube, um, you are 100% in control of what data is collected and how it's used. And that has always been true and it will remain true. Yeah. So, like, hearing your last sentence, we, we can understand it as, like, the future of, uh, of, of Google is definitely 
based on the, on the data acquired throughout the years. But um, do you believe that uh, it's, uh, is it like as important as the brilliant uh, uh, engineers that are working in the company? Or do you believe that the real like assets and the valuable asset that uh, Google is acquiring is data? Or what would you choose between like the brilliant uh, engineers or uh, the data acquired? Well, so, so first of all, um, data has always been the lifeblood of the company. You know, the, the mission of the company is, uh, is to um, collect the world's uh, information and make it universally accessible and useful. And that is true. That was true 22 years ago. It's also true today. And that's digital information, right? Whether it's a search results, access to somebody's website, um, these days entertainment or uh, other useful decision making um, data. That's that's always that's always been true. Um, in answer, the direct answer to your question is I think uh, it's people. Um, hiring is the most important thing that we do because um, what a company is capable, you know, a company isn't a thing. Uh, if, you, if you read books like Homo Deus, you know, the, the, the author there talks very eloquently about these fictions that we've created. A company is a fiction. Uh, the only real things in a company are the people. Yeah. Uh, and it's their collective wisdom and the, uh, the ability to draw together talents in a, in a valuable way uh, that makes the difference. And, you know, we looked at some brilliant, brilliant companies full of brilliant, brilliant individuals who have succumbed. Uh, no one's got a right to be in business today. Um, it has to be earned every day. And that's down to the people. Thanks. Um, I think we, we, we saw that there are many, many questions in the Q&A. So I think we, we're going to have um, um, maybe open Q&A now. So let's open it up to the public. I know you can take over. Yeah, thank you, Roy, uh, Rock, um, Emilio and, and Craig. Um, there are really nice questions, I think. And um, so what I'm going to do is now select one of the questions in the Q&A. And then I will allow you to talk. So, um, and then you will be able to answer your question to Craig. So, uh, the first is Nils Hopper. Hi, Nils. Um, I will now allow you to talk, and you can unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you very much. So, um, hi, Craig. Um, my question would be: If you would graduate from university again, which industry or companies would you go to in order to learn the most? Hi, Niels. Uh, nice to meet you. Thank you for the question. Um, well, first of all, I'd, I'd ask myself very, um, uh, very pointedly, uh, do I, should I go to university? I think that would be the first, the first point. Um, when, when I was at university uh, two decades, three decades ago, it was uh, pretty necessary. I don't think it's so necessary. There are more options than ever uh, today. Um, Industry-wise, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily gravitate to industry. I mean, I, I have sort of peculiar interests. I'm a bit of a gadget geek. I kind of like technology. It excites me. Um, so I'd probably be reasonably naturally drawn to that. I love ideas. I like building things and, uh, and changing things. Um, so I love uh, any industry that's sort of fast-moving and, and, and changing uh, a lot. I have developed probably later in life a, a real sort of admiration and, and fascination with the creative industry. So filmmaking, music, um, this sort of thing. I think it's a, a, a really interesting set of skills uh, that, I, that I admire deeply. But the, uh, the advice I'd give my younger self and certainly all of you is figure out what excites you, right? What, what do you feel really passionate about? Um, and follow that wherever it takes you. Um, don't start with the industry or the company or, or the role or certainly not the, the, the salary, right? Figure out what, what ignites you and do that. And even though uh, it may not immediately be clear, eventually that will lead you um, uh, to, uh, to a, uh, a way of earning money um, and certainly it will make you happy. Thanks, Thank you Nils. very much. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Nils. Um, so now let's move to the second question uh, from the Q&A. So, Alessandro, I hear you have a, a really nice question. You and a lot of 
Boots, I let you talk now. Okay, um, good evening, Craig, first of all. And my question for you was, why did you choose to work for Google? And especially, why do you think that Google decided to hire you over different people? Well, I, I, I don't know on the second one. I think uh, I still believe I was a hiring error. Um, <laughs> I managed to slip through the net. Um, perhaps a combination of right time, right place, and, and some relevant uh, experience, and a little bit of uh, you know um, uh, playfulness, I suppose, and in, uh, in, in, in questioning norms. Um, why did I choose Google? Is a really uh, really interesting question. I, I grew up in a country of three million people um, on the bottom of the world. I'd need to sit on an aircraft for thirty hours, uh, three zero to get there, uh, and pre-internet. So everything that we experience today here in Europe seemed exotic, unreachable, and um, unimaginable when I was growing up, um, but very alluring at the same time. And what technology has done uh, is, is that it's leveled the playing field. It, it's talent and ideas. Uh, so if you've got a smartphone and an idea, you can become a creator, like I said before, but you can also start a micro multinational business. You can talk about an important social issue and trigger change as Greta has, you know, around uh, climate change. And to me today, that still feels like magic, uh, good magic. And, um, and, what drew me to Google is that some of the big platforms that enable that sort of democracy, if you like, um, are Google platforms. And I feel like I'm making a difference in the world. And I think uh, I feel like I'm somehow part of liberating um, a new generation uh, of entrepreneurs, creators, and social thinkers uh, that uh, probably have the opportunity to express themselves that uh, that didn't exist when when I was their age. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Um, so yeah, let's move to the third question, uh, and that one came from um, Adelaide. Uh, I give now the yeah the permission to talk. Adelaide, go ahead. Hi, my name is Adelaide Katya. Uh, uh, I'm from Indonesia and my question is, what is the best advice that you will give your younger self based on all of your knowledge that you have now? Thank you. Thank you, Adelaide, and uh, hello. Um, I have fond memories, memories of, um, of my time in Bali and uh, Nusa Dua and uh, other parts of uh, Indonesia. It was just a short 12 hour flight for me from Auckland. Um, what, what's the best advice I would give to my younger self based on all of, all of what I know now? I think probably um, don't be afraid to take risks because the biggest risk is not taking one. Uh, and uh, and um, I probably was too influenced by what my parents and peers expected of me. Uh, and that was somewhat constraining. So I, th I think if I sort of traveled back in time, I'd probably make a few choices differently. I'd, I'd probably have uh, more, um, uh, more experience with different uh, companies. Um, I'm a pretty loyal employee. If you look at my, look at my LinkedIn, you know, I tend to stay for long periods of, of time at, at individual companies. And I may even have started a business straight out of university. Uh, but uh, at that time, uh, paying back my debt and, and, and kind of getting a sensible job was probably the highest thing on my agenda. Thanks, Adelaide. Thank you, Adelaide. Thank you, Craig. Um, let's move to uh, the question from Jan Paul. Um, you also have a nice question. You can now uh, unmute. Yes, good evening, Mr. Fenton. Thank you for the presentation. It was really nice. And my question would be, what was the biggest challenge you faced and how did you overcome slash solve it? 
Wow, that's that's got me thinking. Thanks for the question, young Paul. Um, the thing that I find really perplexing is um, a current day challenge. I notice a, a polarization um, in society. Uh, people who uh, who have relative privilege and a big section of society who somehow feel marginalized and left behind. And um, I'm troubled by that. And I think probably everyone on this Zoom uh, call is troubled by that. Um, and I, I feel like it's up to us. It's up to me individually and each of us independently to recognize that uh, human talent and capability is evenly spread, but opportunity is not. So I ask myself every day, what can I do about that? Personally, not just in my capacity as, a, as an executive at Google, but personally. Um, and I, I think that is uh, the, the, the problem and the challenge of our time, actually. Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I certainly wouldn't, um, pretend to have the answers to that, but it's something that I think really deeply about, and my family and I think really deeply about, and I try to, you know, I try to act in, in the best way I can uh, personally. Uh, it was actually the, the idea uh, that led to the record label, which is one of the weirder businesses that I've got. Thanks for the question, young people. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. And um, so now we have a question from Elsie Ernst. Um, I kind of like this question, and uh, you may uh, too, actually. So, uh, Ernst, you may actually now unmute yourself. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Luis. I'm from Germany. And Mr. Fenton, my first question for you is, uh, what are your five must-read books for succeeding and mastering life? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ernst, uh, and uh, good, good talk. Um, look, uh, gosh, I'm not sure I'll get, I'll get to five, but I'll, I'll rattle a few off. One of the earliest books that, I, um, that really hit me was a book that my strategy professor at London Business School asked us all to read, uh, and it was called Man's Search for Meaning, Man's Search for Meaning. A um, little bit of a sexist title, but I think what he meant is humankind's search for meaning. Um, and it, it's written by a guy called Victor Frankl, Victor with a K. And it tracks his experience um, uh, during, the, during the war, sort of coping with the adversity that he was facing uh, and how he developed uh, skills and techniques um, to uh, give himself perspective. And really strangely, I think it, it, was a, it was a brilliant book for strategy because it sort of, um, it gives you a, a different framework for uh, thinking about things, uh, actually. So that, that's one I always recommend. There's another one, um, I'm going to leave my desk, but I'm still with you, and I'll show it, show it to you. Here it is, called Who Moved My Cheese? Here you go, take a screenshot. Um, it's by Dr. Spencer Johnson, and it talks about um, uh, some mice that are used to going back to the same place to retrieve their cheese, and it moved. Um, and what a wonderful metaphor for what's happening in today's world. I mentioned Homer Deus earlier on, um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the author there is uh, Yuri uh, I can't pronounce or can't remember his, his surname, um, Amadeus, and uh, he has a, a sequel. Somebody can maybe uh, remember the name and type it into the Harari. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a sequel to that Homadeus book, um, uh, or a, a prequel, I should say, the one before that, um, Sapiens, that's right, Sapiens and Homadeus. I think both of those books are super interesting uh, to, uh, to read. And um, gosh, what, are, what am I reading at the moment? I'm reading at the moment, this is a, this, well, I, I won't just tell you what I'm reading at the moment. The other one I, I find fascinating is um, a book um, 
by Richard Feynman, who was a um, physicist. And he wrote a wonderful book called The Joy of Finding Out. Uh, so I, I used to be a, a, a real sort of avid reader of um, uh, popular science and, and physics. I just find physics really interesting. Uh, and th this guy sort of lived life to the full. He was a physicist. He came up with um, some new laws in thermodynamics, but he was also a bongo player that lived in Brazil for many years and lived life to the fullest. And I think his, uh, he, he was a really interesting mind. I think that's five. Thank you, Mr. Ernst. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Ernst. Um, so now let's move to uh, another question. Uh, the other question comes from Niklas Springer. Uh, hi, Niklas. Um, mm -hmm. You can now start talking. Hi, Craig. Uh, first, really inspiring talk until now. Thank you for that. And with regards to my question, based on your previous answers, I think I already know the answer. But it was if you would choose uh, becoming a consultant after graduating again, if you would graduate nowadays. Well, my first, I, actually, this is, thank you, Nicholas, for the question. My first career was actually as a lawyer. I was a court lawyer. I was a barrister. I did that for six years. So I uh, went into court. I had a horse's hair wig, black gown, little tabs. Uh, we used to read loads of documents and have witnesses. And so I used to do commercial litigation. That was my first job. Um, the second job was uh, consulting. So that was with Accenture. And the reason I took that job is that I felt uninformed still about what business was and I kind of wanted to do some business tourism. And the, the great thing about consulting is that you can work with lots of different companies in uh, different parts of the world. Um, it's been a long time, two and a half years or so in the Netherlands actually and a couple of years in Germany and, and many other parts of Europe. Uh, and, and that was a, a fascinating sort of extended um, period of, of, of study and experience. Uh, would I do it again? Um, probably yes, but I'd probably spend less time doing it. Thanks for the question. Okay, thank you. Awesome, thanks guys. So I think after, um, we have another question from Leah Bochler. And I think after her question, we will, um, hit another last question and then we will close uh, the meeting um, around seven. So Leah, you may uh, ask your question. Yeah, hi Craig, thank you so much for the presentation. I found it really inspiring. And my question is that you mentioned it's easier to create the future than to predict the future, but can you give us any maybe some direction or some tips on how to create the future? <laughs> wow, that's a big question. I, I, I can I can uh, I can only fail to answer that well. Yeah. Uh, but thank you for the question. I I think um, if we confine the question to innovation in a commercial context, um, which I think is the the right uh, confinement for this audience, then business um, and and uh, and enterprise is really about solving problems in a valuable way. So I think it's important when you're thinking about business always to start with a need, an unmet need or a problem that needs solving. And if you can find a, a good way of doing that that's different um, from other options available today, uh, that's likely to be valuable to other people. Uh, as well. It's important to sense check your ideas. Um, is it just your idea uh, or is it something that really is uh, a recognized uh, problem um, with a solution that has value uh, and to evolve that? Um, and I think the, um, I'd say something about the process as well. I talked about play earlier on and I think a central part of play is experimentation. Uh, we, we experiment a lot at Google, there's an alpha version, a beta version, you know, many different iterations. We uh, launch products and, and sometimes kill them uh, as well uh, if they don't work. You know, the Google, Google Glass is a well-known example of that. Um, uh, so uh, the, the process of experimentation and more importantly, creating a context 
in which the people around you and the organization that supports you uh, is going to be there to pick you up off the floor if the thing that you try uh, didn't quite work. So Ken Robinson, who sadly died recently as an educational uh, uh, commentator, had this great phrase, if you're not prepared to fail, then you won't come up with anything original. And I think that to me captures the essence of how to uh, create the future rather than try to predict it. Thank you so much. You. All right, thank Craig. Uh, thanks. And now let's move to the last question. And that question comes from Shiara. Uh, Shiara, I just unmuted you so you may talk. Um, and okay. Answer Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. And my question is, how is entrepreneurship changing and which are the main factors to consider if you want to start a business, considering the evolution of both the digitalized world and society? Thank you. Thanks, Kara. Um, so yeah, I mean, how is entrepreneurship changing? Well, I think, um, access to capital is, is changing. I think there's a lot more investment capital available um, uh, this year uh, than um, prior years. There's, uh, uh, there's not a shortage of capital. Um, I think the, the trend around globalization also makes ideas more transportable. Um, so if I think about sub-Saharan Africa uh, and other big emerging economies um, like those in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Brazil, in Latin America. Um, these, are, uh, th these are wide open spaces and things that have been proven to work in other places can often work uh, in these places and things in these places uh, or ideas in these places might be quite uh, quite different than in other places as well. One of my um, business interests is in a, a company that does um, savings and credit uh, cooperatives, um, which is you know most of most of sub-Saharan Africa is unbanked or underbanked. So that's a need, a, a problem that needs to be solved there. So I would um, I would think global um, from day one. Uh, in, in the way that, uh, that, that you think about business. I think that's something that's changed. I think in the past, it's been more local and expand from there. You can be global from day one. I think there's access, not perfect access, by the way, but access to, to capital uh, like there's never been before. I think we've got a problem uh, with diversity. I would love to see more women founders. I think women founders get about 2% of the available uh, venture capital. That's, that's wrong and it needs to change and it hurts all of us. Uh, and, um, you know, so capital is not evenly spread, but uh, it is more available than in the past. And I think um, the other thing that's different today in entrepreneurship is that you can experiment and iterate a lot better than you could in the past. And you can get real time feedback and uh, many services because they're digital don't require massive capital investment. Um, so you can roll with it and be a little bit more agile uh, and nimble than some of some of the big sort of industrial type businesses uh, of the past. So there are a few ways that I think it's changed. Thanks for the question. Thank you so much. So th thank you everyone for all these questions and um, and all your answers, Craig. I think we we've touched uh, today um, upon many subjects. Uh, maybe before we leave. Uh, uh, will you have a last thing to say, last quote, even if you already said many things, maybe not, or advice maybe, or? Yeah, advice, well, um, I feel bad for Arno because apparently I missed his question there somewhere. I can't see, I'm scrolling through trying to find it. Should we, should we let Arno ask his question? All right, let, let's, 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 uh, quick, let's, uh, sorry. Oh, no, it's Dan, Dan's, Dan's question. Dan's question, how's that? Sorry, Dan, uh, Dan you can yeah, ask a question. What is the most efficient way for students like us to shape a project from a simple, innovative idea? Is that, is that the one, Dan? Um, I think a lot of what I just said is, uh, is relevant to that. Uh, so um, uh, create a wireframe, um, do a proof of concept, a minimum viable product, get it out there as quick as you can, 
throw it against the wall, see what works, see what sticks, iterate, uh, and, um, and and go from there. So you can be a lot more agile. The the thought to leave you with is uh, is to spend this valuable time that you've got at the moment at university um, really getting to know yourself. Think about what moves you, uh, what excites you, what you're passionate about, and just promise yourself that you will pursue that in whatever form it takes. Uh, don't be seduced by peer pressure, uh, company logos, positions, salaries, uh, what your parents or family uh, want you to do, follow your heart. Uh, because if you do that, you'll be happy and you'll probably be good at it. So I'll leave you, I'll leave you with that note. Thank you, Craig. So I think we have much to take away out of this uh, session. Uh, it was very instructive. Thank you again. And um, uh, yeah, and, um, it was very instructive. And if you, as we said before, go and check uh, Coffee, Eggs and Inspiration for so inspiring talks. And um, uh, before everyone leaves, um, we just wanted to also quickly share um, the, our social and uh, website accounts, because if you are interested uh, by today's events and you maybe want to have more inspiration talks, uh, watch, I'm, I'm sharing my screen now, um, you can uh, follow us works you can follow us uh, or you, you can scan um, the, the QR code at the bottom and check our website and um, go, just follow us on the, our social media accounts and, um, and we have uh, lots coming uh, in the future also yeah and maybe if I can just add something um, because we, we started this, uh, this project this year so it's something very uh, uh, so I mean we started from from scratch so uh, so now if uh, if we can still continue to uh, organize that kind of, uh, of events, uh, it will really be uh, uh, with the, the mastery community. If uh, people talk about uh, uh, what happened today, um, what we are uh, what we are doing, because we are really uh, putting a, a lot of efforts to uh, to provide uh, high quality uh, webinars, ID creation meetings, and so on. So, so uh, our idea is really to uh, to gather uh, you guys, you uh, mastery students, interested by uh, by entrepreneurship. Um, so, uh, if you have Still, any questions, um, any uh, advice for us? We are um, starting this club, and we are already uh, very uh, proud of uh, of, um, of this uh, of this webinar. So we are we would be very pleased to have a, a feedback from uh, from your side. Don't hesitate to uh, to keep in touch with us, and uh, let's hope that uh, it's going to be uh, um, in the following years uh, as uh, successful as it uh, as we have uh, started right yeah. now. Yeah. So thank you very yeah, much. You. And thank you again, Craig. Uh, have a lovely evening. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, we hope to see you back in, uh, in Maastricht, maybe next time uh, yeah. <laughs> for a, a real meeting. Uh, that would be uh, awesome. But it was uh, very, very nice to virtually uh, meet you today. Oh, it was my pleasure and my privilege. Thank you all and great questions. Thank you.